Before we start overclocking the CPU, we need to see where the CPU is in regards to its cooling and performance. We're going to run a few programs in Windows. The first is called RealTemp. You can find it at techpowerup.com forward slash RealTemp. It runs in Windows XP, Vista, and 7. Just extract the files into a folder using your favorite unzipping tool. And run realtemp.exe. This program tells us the temperature that each core is running at in degrees Celsius, as well as how many degrees the cores are away from the CPU's maximum allowed temperature. It keeps track of the minimum and maximum temps on each core and what time they occurred at. It also lists the CPU type, its megahertz, the base clock and the multiplier, and the load on the CPU. While idling in Windows, the load will be low because no CPU intensive programs are running. The temperature at idle is around 45 degrees Celsius. For a Core i5 or Core i7 in this case, 45 degrees is high for an idling CPU, and it's a sign of poor cooling. This computer has been running a little over a year, and I know when it was first powered on, the idle temp was in the mid-30s, which was good. Either the cooler has come slightly off the CPU, probably by being moved around a lot, or the thermal compound has started to deteriorate. Only being a year old, deterioration of the compound isn't likely, so the cooler is probably very slightly ajar. This is still well within a safe temperature for a Core i5 or i7. Anything below 90C is safe, and the CPU can run at that temp for years. You'll notice that at idle, the multiplier and therefore the speed keeps changing. This is a power saving feature that is turned on by default in the BIOS. This is a good thing. Your CPU doesn't need to be full on all the time, especially if it's just sitting around doing nothing. When the CPU load increases, it switches to a higher multiplier, and if the CPU is taxed constantly, the multiplier is raised to its maximum. While we are doing our overclocking tests, trying to get the CPU to run as fast as it can, we are going to disable these power saving features in the BIOS. This will make sure the stress tests we put the CPU through are very thorough. We want to put the CPU through the worst possible circumstances to make sure the overclock is stable. Having the power saving features on would give the CPU a break, and that's not what we want. After we reach our maximum stable overclock, we will turn the power saving features back on to save electricity and extend the CPU's life. We have the idle temperature of the CPU. Now we need to find the full load temp. To fully utilize the CPU, we are going to use a program called Prime95. You can find Prime95 on several sites for free and download either the 32-bit version or the 64-bit version depending on whether you're running a 32-bit operating system or a 64-bit operating system. In our case, since we're running XP 32-bit, we'll download the 32-bit version. Extract the zip file using your favorite unzipping tool to a folder, and run prime95.exe. It will default to the Run a Torture Test dialog. To stress the CPU cores to their maximum, and get them as hot as possible, we want to use the in-place large FFTs option. On a Core i7, it will open eight windows. The eighth window is off the bottom of the screen here. The Core i7 has four cores, but can run two threads or processes per core. This is called hyperthreading by Intel. This makes the CPU look like an eight-core CPU to the OS and programs. Core i5 CPUs don't have hyperthreading so Prime95 will open four windows. Keep in mind that this is a worst case scenario for the CPU. It is highly unlikely that all four cores will be kept this busy by any other program or game. Prime95 has been running for about five minutes. If we look at real temp, we see the cores are up to around 84 degrees Celsius. This is another sign the cooler isn't performing well. The temperature shouldn't be going higher than 80 degrees. I'm going to shut the system down and reattach the cooler with some fresh thermal compound and see what that does to the temperatures. I have removed the case cover 
and laid the case on its side. This 8-pin power cable is in the way, so I'll disconnect it along with the CPU fan cable. Before removing a stock Intel CPU cooler, you need to unlock all four of its push pins by rotating them counterclockwise using a flathead screwdriver so the arrow points toward the cooler. Then pull up on each to release them. The cooler can now be removed by pulling straight up, although this often requires a fair amount of force. I'll use a paper towel to remove the majority of the thermal compound from the CPU. Then a cotton swab dipped in 90% or higher isopropyl alcohol to remove the rest of the compound. I'll do the same to remove the compound from the cooler. Before I reattach the cooler, I have to set the push pins back to the locked position by rotating them clockwise using a flathead screwdriver. I'll turn the cooler over so I can apply some new thermal compound. On this round based cooler, I will put a small amount right in the center. When you attach the cooler to the CPU, the compound will evenly spread out to cover the base. Now I'll lower the cooler onto the CPU, making sure the white pins are aligned with the holes in the motherboard. Then I'll push on top of the cooler to get each of the pins through the holes. Once the cooler is flush with the motherboard and the CPU, you need to push down on two of the pins at opposite corners, and then on the other two opposite corners to secure the cooler to the motherboard. Next, I'll reattach the 8-pin power cable to the motherboard and the CPU cooler's fan cable. The cooler is reattached so I'll put the case cover back on and get back into Windows. Alright, we've booted back into Windows. Let's go to real temp and see what the temperature